Hello, and welcome to episode two of the Movement Prescription Podcast. My name's Hussain, and I will be your host for this episode. I'm delighted to have with us Peter Dutton from We Are Undefeatable, and Zoe, a patient with an incredibly powerful story of using physical activity to overcome a stroke she suffered at a young age. In this episode, we're going to be talking about some of the fantastic resources that We Are Undefeatable have, how healthcare professionals can use those resources most effectively, and find out what do patients want to hear when they're starting that journey of recovery, and how they can engineer movement into their lives as part of that rehab. I think you'll find Zoe's story incredibly inspirational and her honest accounts of the challenges she faced in the days, weeks, months, and years after her stroke. Peter Dutton gives us a fantastic insight behind really the aims and purposes of We Are Undefeatable, as well as the big challenges they face in supporting patients with long-term health conditions get more active. He also makes a plea for us to join the consultation that We Are Undefeatable have opened this month that ends on the 30th of September, where they want to find out what do we need as healthcare professionals in terms of resources to support patients with long-term health conditions. Now, without further ado, I introduce We Are Undefeatable, episode two. Hi, guys. Hi. Hello. Thank you so much for recording our podcast today. And I think it's going to be really useful for our listeners. In today's episode, we want to understand how can we best support those with long-term health conditions? Let's start off with, let's find out a little bit about you. And if we start with you, Zoe, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your story? Um, just under two years ago, so the 4th of October 2021, um, I was struck down uh, with a right parietal lobe stroke. Um, up until that point in my life, I'd been physically fit, physically healthy, was um, a prominent member of the gym, um, also cycled, um, and on the 4th of October, uh, was hit down. Well, initially, they thought it was a migraine, was taken into hospital, and two days later, following an MRI scan, it was identified that I had actually had a stroke. Um, I think at that point, it was one of those situations where your life suddenly pauses. It was sort of, you know, what now? Um, you know, from having a full-time job to drive into being in the gym on a regular basis to suddenly not knowing what was going to be around the corner for me. Um, however, I think being such a strong character that I am, you know, I took upon myself to get back out there and try and sort of work on my recovery. And I'm still on that journey now, very much so. And I'm just constantly at the moment continuing to raise awareness. Wow, well, you know, what an incredible story. And I think we're going to we're going to delve deeper into kind of, you know, what happened and, and, and kind of how that played out. But I think just hearing there that you were, you know, so active before and, and, you know, you're doing all the right things and, you know, you can't pick and choose when a long-term health condition suddenly strikes um, uh, despite doing, you know, the, the right things. And uh, Peter, like 43% of the population uh, suffer with a long-term health condition of one kind or another. And, and people with long-term health conditions are twice as likely to be inactive. Now, please introduce your role at We Are Undefeatable and just a little bit about, you know, you know, for, for those that maybe haven't heard of We Are Undefeatable before, a bit about that, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm Pete. I'm the activation manager for We Are Undefeatable. So um, I work with our charity partners and um, also sort of wider stakeholders to to bring the campaign to life and to raise awareness and to help help spread this message that um, physical activity and, and the importance of it for people in the management and prevention of, of long term health conditions. Um, so yeah, in terms of my background, I've um, worked my whole career so far in physical activity and supporting people with health conditions. Um, started out sort of in the GP referral, exercise on referral um, sector and 
on the ground as an instructor delivering physical activity interventions. Um, you know, I've done classes, I've done sessions, I've done consultations and, and helping people with, with programs to be more active. Um, and then went on to do some more specialist stuff like cardiac rehabilitation as well. So got a background in in that side um, and, and really enjoyed working with people and, and seeing the, the progress and the impact that can be made. Um, and yeah, I, I guess since then I've moved into the charity sector, uh, first of all with Age UK um, on the, their walking football program and then in the last sort of 12 to 18 months on the We're Undefeatable campaign and hopefully you know, helping people living with health conditions to be active in a different way, less less on the ground and more spreading that message and encouraging others to to do the same. Brilliant. Brilliant. And and from sort of the perspectives that you've had, for example, working in the cardiac rehab, you know, a, a common question that we get asked as healthcare professionals is, um, is it safe? You know, is it safe to be active after certain incidences, you know, let's say Zoe's stroke or or a cardiovascular event like a heart attack, um, and you know I think there's there's been a, quite a lot of information come out in in particular from the consensus statement. Do you want to maybe just touch on that a little bit? Explain you know sort of what the outcomes yeah, were. Yeah, absolutely. There? That's one of the um, key messages that we're trying to to spread. Um, in particular, I'm working in with healthcare professionals, but we seem to be doing a little bit more work in this space, which is fantastic. Um, <laughs> But yeah, the the um, Faculty for Sport and Exercise Medicine, they published a medical consensus statement on risk. And um, basically it's saying that for people with stable conditions, the benefits of being more active far outweigh the risks. Um, there's obviously some contraindications that need to be um, looked upon as, as part of that. And that's quite clear within the consensus statement. But it's just a really important message for people with long-term health conditions, given that one of the top barriers that they cite is concerns around increasing pain, fatigue, and and making a condition worse. And actually, if we're all on the same hymn sheet, knowing that physical activity is, in, in the most part, safe and, and don't weigh those risks, then it's, yeah. then it's really important. Absolutely. There's, there's actually only very few specific contraindications where, where you need to be more careful. And we will put a link to the consensus statement in the show notes of this podcast for you to review. And as Peter said, there are specific, um, you know, patients that you need to be uh, mindful of uh, and be more careful with. But on the whole, and when we say on the whole, really the vast majority, not only is it safe, it's actually going to improve outcomes. It's going to improve recovery. It's going to improve symptoms. So it's important that we give the patient that confidence because it's quite natural for patients to be nervous about that. And so if I come to you on that very topic, you know, you were an active person before, you know, the tragic event happened. Like, when did you start to think about physical activity? You know, like how many days after the event did it start to become something that was entering your radar as to should I or should I not? The word fear is definitely, definitely very prominent in the early days. Um and I think, you know, initially I was referred to sort of occupational therapist to start sort of on that early recovery journey and that rehabilitation, which was very simple exercise. But returning back to sort of normal type physical activity, it was many, many months down the line. The fear of going back into a gym petrified me, absolutely petrified me. Um, just the thought of what could I have another stroke? Um, and also, I mean, they did diagnose that I had a PFO, a hole, hole in the heart. So I had that closed. And again, I had to overcome the fear of knowing that I had a device in my heart and worrying whether something may happen again. Um, so I do, you know, from my perspective, the fear of doing exercise in those early stages was very prominent. Yeah, And, and how did you overcome that? barrier that sort of fear because for many they 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 struggle to make that jump and to and to restart but clearly you have and was was it support from a healthcare professional was it support from others was it just an inner strength that you know from the experience of being active before i think i've got a strong mindset a growth mindset um so i do think that played a huge part um but i think for me um just started with very simple activities i got some of the you know the stretch bands sort of the resistance bands 
and started to sort of utilize those at home. Um, so very, very small movements and movements that I felt safe doing at home. Um, you know, I'd come from sort of being in the gym, doing lots of heavy strength training to suddenly having to do something a lot smaller and easier. Um, I was also referred um, to um, a gym not far from me to go through some level of sort of gym rehabilitation as well, uh, which that helped build some of my confidence. That was in the early stages, and that indefinitely did help along the way to knowing that I would be okay. Um, yeah, definitely, it's it took a long time. Can you give us a rough idea, like you know, I for example, are you back to where you were in terms of physical activity? Uh, has, has that has that happened, or maybe not? I would say the last three months, I'm back in the gym, probably anything between three and five days per week. That is awesome. And I always aim for half an hour, a minimum of half an hour a day in the gym. And it, the absolute benefits for me, you know, have been phenomenal. I see improvements, even though they say the first six months of having a stroke are critical to your recovery. I've seen small improvements constantly throughout the last couple of years by doing little bits of half an hour's worth of exercise and being able to build up that strength again. Um, so it's definitely, I'm definitely on the right side of things, but I still have my days where I do fear, could this all happen again? Absolutely. I've, that's totally natural. I'd be in the same shoes. And just to give an idea to listener, how many months, years has that taken to get to where you are today? So it'll be two years this October. So I'm literally 11 months, uh, 19 months. No, <laughs> 24. <laughs> 24 months. Perfect. Perfect. And um, Peter, like Zoe had mentioned there that she'd worked with an occupational therapist and, and that um, she had been given some advice and support also in the gym in terms of the rehabilitation. You know, how important is it for healthcare professionals to maybe not be experts, but be knowledgeable when it comes to physical activity. Are, like for example, are, is it the, are the patients looking to us? Is there sort of trust in us in, in terms of delivering these kind of messages? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think this is something that the campaign do quite a lot of research into um, around sort of who our target audience is, people with long-term health conditions, do trust to, to give them advice and what type of advice and what interventions may work for them. And Zoe's actually touched across a couple of those interventions and tried different things, which is fantastic. Um, but yeah, we, we know that after a conversation about physical activity, that um, a quarter of people with long-term health conditions actually took action to become more active once they'd spoken to a healthcare professional. Um, and even more, over 50% actually thought more about it. So it, it's not always around have they gone away straight away and taken an action? But actually, there is that potential to plant a little seed. And I think this is where we want to encourage people to have those conversations about physical activity. And you, you may have heard of interventions like having very brief advice or making every contact count. And even just by planting that seed, it, it could then become something for that person to think about it. Now might not be the right time for them as part of their journey. Zoe's just touched upon some you know, the fear factor around certain things, but then actually that may then come to fruition further down the line and could have a real lasting impact. Um, and it could be something that is brought up in a consultation six months ago. And then the next time you see them, if it's brought up again, having that additional touch point can, can be really impactful. So, so yeah, that's, that's something that, um, that trust in the NHS and, and in healthcare professionals, um, around, physical activity for people with long-term conditions is um, is the most important sort of group of people or type of person where um, the majority of our target audience are looking for that advice. So, yeah, this is an important message. You know, I think some key numbers you mentioned there that were so important is that 25% of people, you know, will, 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 will become more active after advice from a healthcare professional, you know, that's actually really good stats. You know, when you look at, for example, smoking cessation, that's close to like one in a hundred. 
Um, you know, if, if one in four of my patients are going to leave after I've given them advice and have become even that little bit more active, that's, that makes a massive difference. So I think that's a very positive message to be sort of sending out. And is this kind of something that you envisage all staff within sort of primary care to be aware of, or is it really just for kind of occupational therapists and physios? No, I, I would say all staff, uh, staff absolutely. I, I think that um, anybody who has a potential touch point with somebody who is living with a long-term health condition can can play that role. And, and we know that some healthcare professionals will have very limited time in their consultations and time spent with um, their patients compared to others. And, and that's why having those very brief advice or very brief conversations can be quite powerful. But we know that other healthcare professionals or allied healthcare professionals may have a little bit more time to to discuss this and maybe open up a little bit about it and go a bit further and discuss options that may be suitable. But I think if we're all trying to do it um, and we're all having and spreading a similar message, um, like what the campaign does or, or like what the um, medical consensus statement on risk will say, then we we should be then starting to make an impact together and and sort of mm. having that you know joining that movement and encouraging more people to to move more. Fantastic, Zoe. Why did you get involved with We Are Undefeatable? Where did that story come from? Did they approach you? Did you approach them? Please, I'd love to know. Um, I actually saw um it was on the website. Uh, there was an opportunity to sort of connect. Um, a life-changing event like stroke um, and fitness together for an opportunity to do an advert. And obviously with my passion previous to my stroke of being into fitness and well-being, it just seemed like the perfect opportunity. Um, so I approached the casting company, did the casting, and next thing there was a call to say, you're one of our four. Um, mm. So next thing they were here filming it. <laughs> yeah, and I think for me, um, I, I really want to sort of continue to support, you know, people around me and continue to raise awareness that, you know, physical activities definitely play a key part in either your recovery or your long term well being. And you can live with long term illnesses, you know, by actually having the right level of fitness within alongside your everyday life yeah you know and for me that's something wanting to echo ongoing since the day my stroke happened yeah and i can see that clearly movement for you uh, in particular gym from from for how you said it is it's something that you really enjoy and you prioritize you know going three to five times a week yeah. that's fantastic that is such phenomenal um dedication and commitment I, i'm impressed and like it doesn't have to be the gym, does it? Like it, it right. movement can be anything, uh, as long as you're getting, you know, bit hot, bit sweaty, bit out of breath. You know, you can be doing whatever it is. Um, it all counts. Now, I feel for you, you had a great kind of background of physical activity, and that probably served you really well when you're trying to overcome that fear. Now, this is a question to both of you guys. Maybe if so, if you start, and 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 then then I'd love to hear your comments, Peter. What about the patients that maybe haven't ever sort of, they haven't really got involved with physical activity before, they get diagnosed with a long-term health condition, and now they've got the extra challenge of trying to get active for the first time while burdened with a long-term health condition? You know, what kind of things do you think we need to be thinking about here and, and thinking about what healthcare professionals need to do there? I know this is a difficult question, but we're trying to, trying to explore this Zoe yeah no absolutely I think you know from my perspective the immediate intervention that I got was absolutely fantastic um in those early stages that first six months there was some intense support wrapped around me um and I think you know that's really positive for each and every individual that goes through something like stroke I think for me where the journey can be more challenging for those who maybe haven't got a similar mindset to myself, is that mid to long term journey, that journey where maybe it's not coming from our primary sort of NHS sources, it's maybe coming from somewhere else. 
Um, it's mm. where do they go? What's that signpost that they need? Who, which communities that they need to go and join? Who can support them? Because I do believe communities are play a big part in keeping people motivated, you know, but actually do they know where to go? And I think to me, that's where I possibly would have struggled if my mindset hadn't have been the way that it was previously. Yeah, yeah, really good points. And I think sometimes, like, as a healthcare professional, we don't need to be the expert on every aspect of physical activity. But as you said there, signposting, knowing where in your community there are, your role is, as Peter mentioned before, plant the seeds, signpost them to, for example, maybe it's the allotment group, maybe it's a dance class that's, that's going locally, and maybe even using other um, healthcare professionals like social prescribers who are going to know what's going on in your community and, and maybe able to support the patient to join in those groups because within those community groups there's a wealth of experience and knowledge and we all know that when we get active with others it's more fun isn't it it's more fun it's more motivating and in particular if you're scared because you're trying to overcome something like a stroke being around others can be a bit more reassuring isn't it peter what are your thoughts yeah i I think that that last point is is a really good one and I, i think from our perspective it's kind of knowing potentially what works for that person and um, because every single person will will be different and maybe motivated in in different ways so you just mentioned the social element there um it may be that people want to do activities within the comfort of their own home it might be that somebody really wants that structure and wants to go down a a formal physical activity route like a um, exercise on referral program for example and and work with an instructor and, and have that sort of reassurance from that perspective. Um, so I think it's it's important to find those things within the person or the patient who's in front of you to know a little bit around what what might motivate them to, to be more active and, and what might work for them. And as, as Zoe mentioned, having then a bit of an armory of different resources and tools available, whether that's something like We're Undefeatable, which is there to provide that inspiration and and show real life stories to people of how they can be more active and see other people with the same health conditions um, to make it a lot more relatable around, oh, actually, if someone else with similar conditions can do it, then then so can I. Um, So something like a universal offer and resources like We're Undefeatable can be really useful. But I would also say you also need to then know what's going on in your local area and um, and what can work, whether that is a referral or the the community physical activity programs that are going on locally. Um, and I think it just comes around a, a knowledge and awareness of physical activity, in particular for people with health conditions. And, and there's great resources out there like Moving Medicine, um, which, which can support people to um, in, increase their knowledge and awareness of physical activity. But as you said, you don't need to be an expert and know the ins and outs of of all of it to sort of be able to have that very brief advice. It's more of a, I guess, a softer skill, a personable approach, which is more just finding out about that person and, and what might work for them. Um, so, yeah, that that would be some things that I, I can think of. Yeah, and you mentioned moving medicine there, and that is a fantastic free resource, which I'd really recommend everyone to have a look at, and we will put a link uh, in the show notes. And there probably what's most useful that I find is they've got one minute and five minute conversations that you can have. So even in those really tight consultations, just just doing one minute, just planting the seeds, inviting the patient, finding out their thoughts and knowing a, a quick resource that you can send. So I'll give an example, um, the, the, you know, a, a patient that maybe can't get out and get active. Maybe you want to give them resources that they can do at home. And there's Make Your Move that We Are Undefeatable have done. A really good set of videos that they can access um, through the YouTube channel um, that I find really useful. I just pop it on my text messaging service and I'll just text it uh, to the patient or the loved one or carer, whoever's best able to utilize the technology. Um, and yeah, and it's just, it's a way for them just to get active at home. So just kind of knowing enough means that it just it allows you to do these things in a sort of a, a a concise way that you don't need to stress about it, meaning that you're going to be running over in your consultation. It can be as little as a minute or two minutes if you have to. Of course, when we've got more time, we can dedicate and we can have sort of those deeper conversations. But 
We've got to be careful not to have inaction just because we can't have those deeper conversations due to time, isn't it? We've got to balance those two. Now, we've touched on some resources. Um, shall we maybe discuss a couple of those? Are any kind of key ones that you want to highlight that you think healthcare professionals will find useful? Yeah, absolutely. I, th- I think from a from a we're undefeatable perspective, I, I touched upon our stories like Zoe's, and I think they really show the challenges that people do face and and live up to, you know, the, that real life experience that somebody has when when living with the symptoms and the challenges they face with a health condition. But then has a really positive and empowering way to then share how they then go around building up their physical activity and and overcoming that and Zoe shared some of that today but within even Zoe's content film which is only a minute long as a resource it, it shows the physiotherapy exercises that Zoe did which now she's probably over over the 24 months has increased from and and, and is now probably doing exercises in the gym so I, I definitely say our stories is a good place especially for people who may be a little bit ambivalent about being more physically active and maybe need a little bit more persuasion. And and that's where we found from a campaign perspective that actually sharing somebody else's story and how they're being more active can be quite impactful. Um, but yeah, you mentioned our YouTube channel. So, so mm. that's, a, that's also a great place to start. Um, it's got our make your move videos on there. Um, which are sort of 15 minutes in, in duration. They have um, seated and standing and assisted options. Um, and building on from that, last year we developed our Move to Your Mood campaign, which had um, everybody's favorite Gok Wan, who is our um, a- ambassador. And um, he lives with asthma and wanted to really get involved with the campaign. And we did, um, based on our really consistent campaign research, that the main benefit for our target audience of being active consistently came through that it was around improving mental well-being we wanted to to develop move to your mood to try and encourage people whatever mood they're feeling that that they can be active so they're short five minute physical activity videos um that are all around whether you're feeling relaxed needing a bit of a boost that day or also um feeling a little bit more energized and up for maybe doing a bit more of a a workout, I guess. Um, So that's, again, a a really great resource on there. And we've got things that are sort of available in a um, a online version, but also we have some offline versions as well. Um, And from our perspective, in particular for healthcare professionals, um, off the back of the recent work that we've been doing with with RCGP, with our ambassadors like yourself and, and Dr. Zoe Williams, we, we wanted to, to develop a healthcare promotional pack. So actually this week, um, we should be launching our new healthcare promotional pack, which is designed for healthcare professionals to have a one-stop shop of all of the campaign's resources that, that they can use to support people with health conditions to be active. Um, so there's that section and then there's another section specifically for practice managers as well and and that's more focused on uh, resources and assets like videos like our TV ad that can go on a a screen or posters and leaflets that can be placed in um, waiting areas where patients are going to be and and can be inspired by the positive imagery and messaging that that the campaign has so that that should be a, a really great place for healthcare professionals and hopefully any practice managers to to give that a, a good go that also includes our our conversation starter and we've also it, it, great that you mentioned it before Hussein around um a text messaging template as well because we know that some systems they have to be built in but others can be tweaked and and yeah. as you said you can add certain links in there so we wanted within this healthcare promotional pack to make it really easy for healthcare professionals to pick it up find the resources and be able to, to make actions um, and to align to the, to the campaign message and, and tone of voice that, that we know works so well. So, yeah, that's, that's a little bit about sort of some of the assets and resources that we have for people with health conditions, but also things that can enable um, healthcare professionals to, to encourage that message as well. Perfect, perfect. And I think the promotional pack is really useful. I had a look through it and it's 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 something I'd really recommend, whether it be sort of the, the adverts you can pop in the TV in, in, in your waiting room, 
um, to having kind of posters there for... Because often these kind of signs, patients do read. They do take notice of it. And it being in the um, healthcare establishment, um, whether that be a community centre or be the GP surgery, it makes a difference. So we, we do have to send the right messages out. Fantastic. Zoe, what's what's on the cards for you in terms of physical activity? Is it still something that that you're you feel that you're sort of growing into? Have you got other other plans in terms of what kind of uh, movements that you want to incorporate? Yeah, um, I mean, at the minute, at the moment, I'm just it's just trying to progress and just get stronger, you know, day on day. Um, I think that's one of the most important things for me. You know, I was saying just earlier that. I do feel that every day I do see a change. Every week I do see a change. So for me, it's just consistency. You know, I do. I still do have bad days. On, on, on those bad days, I choose to go for a walk, you know, and, you know, and just going for a walk can just give you a better mental state. And, you know, that's just a big tick in the box for me. It doesn't have to be just about my physical. It can be, it can be about my mental sort of state on some days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you touched, that's such an important point, isn't it? Because like we all have good and bad days, but especially if you have long-term health condition, those those swings can be bigger. I think just adapting as you did there, you know, like knowing that, okay, maybe today's not the day to do what you had planned, but you're still going to get active in a different way, maybe a lower intensity, maybe a shorter duration. I think that's so important, isn't it? And I think a good tip maybe for healthcare professionals to advise, to let the patient know to go at how they feel, you know, try and try and find the right kind of level yeah i think it's ultimately you've got to go out and do something because i think even yeah. if it's as small as things you'll always feel so much better um you'll have achieved something yeah and it's never too little is it like even a, a five minute walk is worthwhile even to just declutter the brain yeah yeah and get some sunlight <laughs> fresh air no you're, you're totally right and and have you spoken to sort of many people in a similar situation to yourself, for example, have suffered a stroke and, and maybe aren't as confident in getting active as you were? Yeah, so I'm part of a number of different community groups, um, especially those younger stroke survivors, um, sort of people from the age of sort of early 20s to sort of my age, um, just constantly talking and sort of supporting those that are struggling to sort of take those steps into utilizing fitness well different forms of activities to help with their recovery you know because a lot of the time their mental health has been hit hard you know they don't know what their next chapter in their life is going to look like um you know and just trying to support them and and sort of nurture them to sort of say you know just attempt to do the smallest of things you know one of the first things that I did I used to use um little pegs and clip them onto egg cups because my hands weren't strong my fingers weren't mm. strong so I used just to try and get my brain to sort of focus on my fingers I used to sit with a peg and clip it to an egg cup and that's all I used to do every day um just to try and strengthen my fingers and to get that movement going back in my fingers um you know and that took me a long time to do, but, you know, at, but where I am today, yeah. you know, and the smallest things count. That, that was a, a really poignant um, yeah. moment within your, the, the films that were created as part of the campaign, actually. It showed um, Zoe doing some of these exercises at the start and, and then actually how it then moved to enabling a little bit more in Zoe's life that didn't necessarily ha have to go to doing more activity or exercise. It was actually around... You could then put the key in the door and and open the door, or there was there was things where you were doing your sort of resistance bands, and then showing that that actually helped you to lift the bags, the shopping bags, out of your car. And and I think that's also something that's really important is those sort of wider benefits to to someone's daily life that um, that these little activities, as small as they yeah. may seem, that Zoe's just explained, can have such a positive impact on. On somebody's life whether that's around their in independence or or their ability to do things that they may have previously been able to do um pre pre their diagnosis and that yeah that that's a really poignant moment in in the um videos that were created isn't it though 
Yeah. You're directly training kind of what you need um, to do day to day that before you would have probably taken totally for granted without a moment's thought. Um, but, you know, when you're put in a position as you are, you were having to retrain those things up. And I think I think often that's probably what I try to highlight with patients the most. It's probably one of the biggest benefits of training and physical activity is it's trying to maintain a body that's able to live independently um, as we get older or as we suffer with with various different illnesses. Because at the, at the moment, people, you know, maybe get active because they want to stay fit or they want to have energy, etc. But we need to also stay active now so that you can carry the shopping, so that you can get in and out of the car, so that you can, you know, dress yourself, so that you can... Um, you know, just do all the things that, that we take for granted when when we're young and, 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 and healthy. So it's that longevity, isn't it, that, that's so important. And long-term health conditions, there's no difference. Like w- one thing that I'd say healthcare professionals probably struggle with the most, and it's probably the, the main reason why they may not broach the topic of physical activity, is because they worry that patients are going to be offended or they are going to react negatively to a healthcare professional, you know, trying to encourage activity, you know, like, what are your thoughts, Zoe? Like, I know that obviously you would are very receptive and very open. And and I think you've got that mindset. And I think that's brilliant. Uh, I wish I could, you know, clone it and send it around the world. But (laughs) some people are in other sort of mindsets. and, and, And it's not specifically their fault, but maybe they're going through other things, maybe with their mental health or social stresses, et cetera, that the healthcare professional is nervous, is nervous about broaching these kind of topics. Uh, Is this something that you've thought about at all? Yeah, I think it's a really hard one because, you know, know, ultimately that person's got to want to do that for themselves, you know, no matter – how much somebody tries to guide them or how much advice somebody tries to sort of deliver in the respect of, you know, by enabling themselves to do a level of exercise is going to lengthen their lifespan or, you know, enable them to be able to go out and do things that they couldn't do. I think, you know, ultimately it's got to come from within and it's just so, I think it's more about landing very simple messages to people um, that are key for me and and those key messages that are going to enable that person to go, I need to change, I need to do something. You know, it's got to come from within and, okay. you know, but they also, that's one of the things I think I like about, you know, We Are Undefeatables is the fact that it's all ages you know, it's, you know, someone can relate to somebody, you know, this is people that will be able to relate to me from the advert or from my interview, you know, but then there'll be somebody else that will be able to relate to someone maybe a little bit older or, you know, it's those simple messages or being able to give them a message where they can relate to something that they can see like the We Are Undefeatables adverts or campaigns. That's a really good point, that relatable element like often it's how we phrase these conversations. And one thing I'll tell patients is uh, I'll say that, oh, you know, I've 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 managed and, and supported patients like yourself. So maybe it's a stroke, maybe it's type 2 diabetes, whatever uh, you're dealing with with that patient. And they've found some great benefits from getting active. What do you think? I think that's really important. If, if you go in with that kind of invitation, and just trying to make it kind of relate and connect with what they are rather than going in, oh, you've got type 2 diabetes. I really feel that you should exercise a lot more. That's going to help. That comes across very differently. And if depending on how the patient is and, and kind of what's going on, they can be offended by that. So I think kind of relating it, as you said, and inviting the patient, because it, as you say, it has to come from within. The, the, the healthcare professional is never going to be able to do that work for the person. Um, Peter, what do you think? Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think to build on that, there's, there's certain techniques that um, we know can help or, or not help people and, and make mm. them shut down. And I think, you know, there's there's lots that you can go into and stuff that I was trained on as a instructor previously was around sort of motivational interview and how to sort of facilitate those conversations. And it's probably the word facilitate that's the word to take through it. It's like fighting that expert 
um, like wanting to give someone advice, as you said, if you say you need to do X, Y, Z because of X, Y, Z, then it might not relate to that person. It's not, it's not going to cut through and just fighting that reflex of writing or wrong isn't, isn't, isn't a, a great, um, approach to take. So certainly there's, there's some great stuff around sort of motivational interviewing, which can just help to, to facilitate those conversations and, and things that I know are built into those conversation starters and, and resources like um, moving medicine, I think, yeah. are, are really important. So th- there's certainly there's certainly that side of it. Um, but I also think that from a patient's perspective, they probably sometimes want to go in there and know what what at, at that point of diagnosis. That's a, a really important time because. As, as Zoe touched upon earlier, it's, it's a new thing. It's, it's a bit of a scary world. It's something that they, they want to know about. And that very first intervention, as Zoe said, is, was managed really well in your case, Zoe. And it could be a great time to mention that as part of a, a treatment plan or, or, as, or as a recovery process. Because again, if it's mentioned early on, yes, there might be medications and things that will help to manage that condition first and foremost. But actually, having physical activity and talking through some of the benefits that they're incorporating that in at that point can be really can be really powerful i know from a, a cardiac rehab point of view people have had a, sometimes some of the most significant life events in, in that they'll ever come across and they're coming to you and and they're worried about being um physically active and and they want to they want to put it right and and, and get back um, the health and, and sometimes people be coming into those classes wanting to do a lot more than what they should have been doing and I'd be saying no you need to slow down and they want to actually progress further, further through a, a, an earlier stage but I think that's a really key time in someone's readiness to change because at, at that early stage that they might be quite ready because they've you know they've had that life event happen to them and, and they want to try and do hopefully everything in their power to to make a difference. And I think if you can go down a route of managing that within your lifestyle, potentially rather than or, or alongside medications that, that can support, then um, hopefully that's a message that cuts through really well from from my perspectives. And I'm sure you've heard the same as saying people don't want to be taking a concoction of of medications and, and actually want to try and put things right. So I think it's just around framing those little messages that Zoe mentioned earlier and making it in a way that it's going to benefit that person, I think can be, can be quite powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Framing is so important, isn't it? And, uh, and kind of that can influence how any of the kind of approaches that you take are perceived. And that's so important. It's so important, especially early on. And you mentioned those key moments, you know, you are right. Like sometimes we're nervous about, um, you know, bringing up these kind of topics at those key moments because we're worried that the patient's got a lot going on. But I think you are right that often they are the, the sort of the peak moment where potentially behavior change can happen. Um, and so it's it's about asking and inviting the patient to see whether they would be interested to find out more. Uh, and there's no harm, you know, if if you have it in an open, non-judgmental invitation and the patient uh, approaches it and is keen, then fine, you can go ahead. If they're not keen, if they say, no, this isn't something I want to talk about, then fine, you've planted a seed there, leave it. And you never know that the patient may approach it later down the line, isn't it? So I think I think that's some really, really important points. And you, you, you touch on some that moving medicine. Yes, it has a really good sort of breakdown of how you can go about motivational interviewing if that's something that uh, listeners uh, don't feel comf- confident doing. So I would recommend reviewing that material. Zoe, now going forward, what would you say, let's say, if we go back to the start of, of the your journey that you've been on since suffering the stroke, I know that you've had some great interactions with healthcare professionals. What would you say was sort of the the most important thing that you needed early doors you know what is it that healthcare professionals need to try to um uh, focus on to patients that maybe are within maybe let's say the first month after an event or a diagnosis um you know, any thoughts from your experience um i think 
having um, an immediate interventional plan, but sort of that mid to long term for me was something that was really important. Um, you know, and I think for me, that mid to long term isn't always there. Um, being able to understand as well sort of what things mean, I think for me as well, there was so much thrown at me, so much, so many terminologies thrown my way that I didn't understand in the early days. You know, and that was quite overwhelming in the early days. You know, what does that mean to me? What can I do with what you're telling me? Um, and I think sometimes sort of changing the language into a way that, you know, that individual will understand um, that probably was something that I would have liked to have seen more of in those earlier yeah. stages. But I think my early intervention was absolutely excellent. I know that across the UK it's very different. You know, it's a little bit like a lottery, um, certainly when it comes to stroke. You know, I had a great experience in regards to that early stage. You know, I know other stroke survivors who have had very different types of interventions provided quite minimal. Um, but I think for me, it's more just getting the right answer and the right questions and being surrounded by the right communities as well. You know, for me, I did did do a lot for myself, you know, go and try and find sort of young stroke survivor groups, have people to talk to that I could relate to, um, you know, because so many people were saying, you're too young to have a stroke. You know, did you have a stroke? And I was like, yes, I absolutely did have a stroke and it can happen to anybody. Um but then, you know, you, there was those lonely times and trying to find those groups and they are undefeatable, you know, holistically offers something for all age groups. Yeah, absolutely. I think you mentioned that sort of clarity of communication is just so important yeah. when stress is high. And sometimes we think we're being clear, but, but you're, you're using jargon that you're used to and the patient may not. Yeah. And also... The patient is currently really scared, so they may not even absorb all the information that you're delivering. And I think a key tip is we've we got to check in with the patient because they may be too polite to want you to repeat. And there's no harm just going, you know, like I've given some information here. Does that all make sense? Because then you need to open and invite them to go, oh, actually, no, I don't know what you mean by this term. And I don't know what that's going in. So, yeah, clarity of communication is so important. And you also touched on the fact that you need to be aware of the plan because often like we know the plan, the plan's written in your notes and we think we've kind of told you what it is, but, but there's, there's, there's no harm. And I think it's really powerful for patients to kind of know what the next steps are because it, it does give you a bit of hope, isn't it? You can see kind of where you're going, what's in the pipeline, what are the options and hope's really important when you're, you know, struggling to to do some of the basic movements. For example, whether it be a stroke, you 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 you're not the same person as you once was. So, planning and clarity of of, of conversation, I think, is really important there that you touched on. Thank you, Zoe. And and, and Peter, what about what about you? What what do you think is uh, in, in those early weeks? It, can, it may not be a stroke and something as acute as that, but let's say after the first month post-diagnosis of a long-term health condition, what, what do you think are, are the key messages? Yeah, but I was just actually going to build upon one of the things that you mentioned there around checking in. I think that's such an important thing. Um, you know, we know that you probably have, you may have created that plan of, of what that recovery is, but actually coming back and, and talking about it and touching on it at the next time that review is there is is equally as important um, and I think actually it's a really positive time especially from a physical activity sense to um, check in on how that person's journey has gone a lot like um, we we found out a lot more around Zoe's journey over the last 24 months because actually celebrating those little successes and and this doesn't have to be in in the same for for physical activity it can be for different walks of how that person is recovering with with that condition um, because that positive reinforcement, actually, you know, how did it go when we signposted you to the local community class or, OK, you've gone and completed your um, 12 week GP referral program? You know, what are the benefits? How how has it impacted you? What what positives have you found from that? I think that can be really important as well. It's sort of reflecting back on the conversation that you, you might have had at the start of of that consultation or, or at that point of the person's journey and then 
coming back and celebrating those those small successes that can be had. I know from Zoe's point of view today, sort of different muscle groups, but you've talked about sort of the progress of clipping the pegs onto egg cups. And then before we, we started the, the recording today, you were telling me that you were um, leg pressing over 100 kg of weights in the gym. And, and I think Ooh. that... You know, you've you, that, that that progress. Obviously, different muscle groups, but still, you that that is really worth celebrating. And probably in between those twenty-four months of where you've got to, there's been lots of little successes in between. And I think that that trust in the healthcare professionals that we mentioned earlier can then be a really powerful vehicle for that positive reinforcement to to come back later on. Um, so sorry to bring that up, Zoe. <laughs> no, what? No, Tess is sorry. That's incredible. What an incredible <laughs> feat. Yeah, no, absolutely. But and I think, you know, it, again, it's thinking, I think we've also got to think about the different generations and sort of the, the diversity of our communities. You know, ultimately, not one service is going to fit everybody. You know, it's like, you know, Generation Z, for instance, you know, they, the way that, stroke survivors of that generation want to be supported will predominantly be very different to the way that I want to be supported. A lot of what they'll want to do, they'll want to interact through YouTube. They'll want to interact through WhatsApp community groups. That will be the way that they will want to be supported on their recovery journey, where for me, I probably want more physical interaction and sort of have those sort of in-the-face meetings with people. But I think we've also got to take those into consideration when we're sort of looking at what services we need to put in place for different communities and different generations as well. Yeah, yeah, no, very well said, very well said. And I think uh, I think today's episode has just been really, really, really sort of useful to kind of shine a light on what it is that we need to go about to support those with long-term health conditions. And I think not just in terms of supporting them to get active, but just about having conversations with them in a way that uh, they have clarity as to what's going on. They have confidence because undoubtedly, if, if they feel confident about the plan, then they're far more likely to want to engage with any other plans that you may want to have, for example, physical activity. So I think we've, we've, we've actually looked slightly wider than, than I originally uh, anticipated. Now, I want to ask a question that I have asked every guest so far, and it's basically around a statistic that unfortunately, since the 1960s, we are 20% less active now, okay? And that's not a great statistic. But my question is, in 20 years time, do you think we are going to be more active, the same, or less active than now as a population? And I'll give you a few moments to think about that. And uh, we'll, we'll go to Peter first. Uh, what are your thoughts? What, what does your magic bowl tell you? I am going to say that I'm going to go on the positive side. I think actually we, we I hope and I think that we will be more. I think that even in the 10 years that I've worked in the sector, there's been so many new initiatives coming out and, and a lot more targeted work um, specifically around different um, populations, different demographics that might have widening health inequalities and, and people living with long-term health conditions. As, as you mentioned earlier, it's a huge part of our population and there's so much more and more coming out about it. I think that if we do join the movement together and connect across different sectors and have that sort of joined up messaging and and um, ambition between us all, I, I think that we can do it. So I I, I would like to start by saying, um, yeah, I think we can we can be in a better place in twenty years than, than what we are now, and and hopefully that will be the case because um, obviously working in this sector. You like to hope that you're going to make a difference, maybe not on a national level. Well, we should be making a difference yeah. on a national level. But um, yeah, hopefully the work that a lot of people within the sector who are, have a professional interest in physical activity for long term conditions. I'm sure I speak for us all that we, we want to make that difference and hope that that difference can be made. Absolutely. I think I think you guys are already making a difference and definitely from 
my day to day work, I find we are undefeatable and its resources and, and the sort of the messaging that it puts out so invaluable. And I can't recommend my fellow colleagues to, you know, if you haven't reviewed the material, review it, because I promise you, when, once you do, you'll want to get patience looking at it because um, so it's, it's powerful stuff. I'll be honest. It really is powerful stuff. Zoe, what are your thoughts? Are you as positive as Peter or uh, have you got other ideas? Are we going to get more active, less active or stay the same in 20 years time? I would like to say we're going to get uh, more active. I know it says less, less than, but more. <laughs> I would like to say more. I think I look at it slightly different. I think, you know, we've got all of our services around us, but I also think, you know, we've got the digital world, you know, we've got so much to offer on, on, on different websites, mm. you know, that there's so much accessible to so many people. Um, so I do think, you know, everybody can do something and, it, and it, they can access it in whatever way and whatever means they want to access that form of support, whether that's going to a gym or whether that's going on a YouTube um, channel and finding some kind of exercise to do from a YouTube channel. So, you know, for me, I do think it's going in the right direction. I think digital's helping. Fantastic. Fantastic. That, that is extremely positive and so have you got any sort of last things you want to let listeners know sort of let the healthcare professional community know i think i think for me i think just the smallest of exercise will make a difference you know for me it's been a two-year long journey but a journey that if i hadn't started with the smallest of things i wouldn't be where i am today um i think consistency is key when it comes to exercise and it's, and it's possible for anybody to do. Small steps make a difference, isn't it? If you keep putting those steps one on top of each other, you have a staircase. Um, but it all starts with the little steps. You know, such such an important point. Accept the failings as well. You know, those bad days, they're okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. And adapt. I think that's something from earlier in the episode that I think was so beautiful is that we've got to learn to change tactic and change plan because... It can't be either yes or no. We've got to sometimes just adapt and just go, do you know what, maybe we can't do the workout we had planned, but we can do something else that we still find beneficial. Uh, and, and Peter, like, uh, you know, you mentioned about how healthcare professionals can sort of become more involved and, and help contribute. I know about the sort of the We Are Undefeatable big talk. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about that? And I know it's opening in September, uh, how long is it going to be open for? Yeah, so um, We're on the Feet of a Big Talk is our sort of public consultation that um, we're hoping to reach people living with lo uh, long-term health conditions, um, their carers, and also then anybody who has a professional interest. And I would say healthcare professionals are a, a huge part of that who are seeing people with long-term health conditions day to day. Um, and basically, we're, we're looking to shape the future of We're Undefeatable and what resources and tools we can provide next. And um, we need the information from, from the people to, to get involved in that. And whether that's what's going to work for somebody who's living with a health condition or actually what will enable a professional to then have those conversations or to integrate physical activity into their daily practice. So it's open for just for the month um, throughout the 4th to the 30th of September. Um, but what we will be doing is sort of collating that evidence, sharing that with people um, to then see the sort of impact that it can have. And, and we should be able to segment the data by um, – professionals or by healthcare professionals so if if there's ever an opportunity for us to share that insight back with yourself um and, and with with the network and and to listeners then then we'd love to do that because i'm sure we're going to get such rich data from from the vast amount of people who will be able to respond to it um so yeah any contributions from healthcare professionals and it doesn't have to be gps it can be any sort of healthcare professional um we, we'd love to hear your thoughts on it because um we, we want to make sure that everybody's voice is, is heard in this because we, we can then hopefully develop something that's really exciting and, and can make a, a huge impact to the lives of people with health conditions. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you both for your insights, for sharing your story, Zoe, and Peter sharing your professional experience, as well as um, all the really useful 
sort of resources and information that's in the We Are Undefeatable campaign. I'd really recommend people look at the promotional pack, look at the resources, you know, get inspired by the patient stories. These are real life stories, real patients with with long term health conditions across all ages, ethnicities, gender. And it's kind of through them that we can help to inspire patients because at the end of the day, we all know how powerful it is to see someone like you achieving something and, and, and therefore connecting it with your own story. So I'd really recommend delving into that resource and, and getting more confident with that. If healthcare professionals wanted to get in touch with We Are Undefeatable, let's say outside of the, the big talk, let's say they just wanted to find out a bit more, where, where would you recommend it? Is there a way that they can sort of uh, uh, maybe seek out some guidance or support with We Are Undefeatable? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would advise people to take a look on, on the website first because you can get, as yeah. you said, you can get a real feel for what, what's there. Um, but we do have our We Are Undefeatable email as well, which I can share um and can be linked to from here. I'd also yeah, we'll encourage do. people to reach out to me as well. Um, we know that people are looking to sort of encapsulate the campaign in their areas and to create initiatives off off the back of it because they align with the campaign's message and, and want to sort of join that movement. So again, that's where I can come in and, and maybe support on some more bespoke or, or tailored initiatives that, that people may be looking to get involved in. Um, so yeah, please please feel free to reach out. But yeah, I'd say best way is, is via email. Perfect. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed listening to that episode. I found it extremely helpful to understand exactly what we are undefeatable are trying to achieve. And I was blown away by Zoe's honesty in terms of the challenges that she faced and how movement has always been such an integral part of her life. And I think what I take from it most is that we need to understand what it is that our patients want to achieve. What is it that they see on their roadmap? Because when patients have agency and feel like they have a direction, then they're always going to do better in my opinion. I hope you found that helpful and I look forward to joining you again soon on the Movement Prescription Podcast.